Hello, and welcome to this public lecture for the 2020 Festival of Social Science, brought to you by Durham University's Department of Anthropology. I'm Professor Helen Ball, the director of the Durham Infancy and Sleep Center and co-founder of the Baby Sleep Information Source. We'll be talking today about normal infant sleep and how an anthropological view helps to explain our baby's sleep behavior and thereby can help parents to manage the disruption to their own sleep that babies can cause. We're focusing on normal infant sleep specifically because what is considered normal can be contentious. Here are three different but commonly used ways of thinking about this. What's culturally normal tends to reflect the dominant social and historical ideologies within cultural groups. Cultural normalcy underpins people's expectations of what's right or what should happen. So some of the things that parents are told about babies that come from a culturally normal view of infant sleep in the UK are that good babies sleep all the time and having a good baby is the sign of a good parent. Crying is good for babies. Babies will be spoiled if they're picked up. And babies must learn to self-soothe. Rocking or cuddling your baby to sleep prevents this. Now this may differ from statistical normalcy, which is grounded in empirical data and refers to the average or normative range of a phenomenon in a given population. The statistically normal view of infant sleep comes up in authoritative sources of advice, such as baby books, charts in baby clinics, magazine articles, emphasizing how much sleep a normal baby should be getting in 24 hours. Examples include statements that babies should be sleeping 18 hours a day at five months of age, or babies should be sleeping for a five hour stretch at night when they're three months old, or that babies need three two hour naps a day for optimum cognitive development. The third way of thinking about what is normal infant sleep invokes the idea of biological normalcy, which seeks to understand what the evolved biology of mothers and babies tells us about the needs and abilities of babies and how they change over the first few weeks and months of life. A biologically normal view of baby sleep considers that baby, mothers and babies are an evolved unit whose biology is intertwined. Babies are born with a set of physiological survival skills that, that must be met by their carers. And biology drives infant sleep. It's not a learned skill. So what does this biologically normal view of infant sleep that anthropologists like me uh, favor look like? Well, our starting point is to remember that humans are mammals. Considering that human babies are also mammal babies can help us make sense of their behavior. All mammal babies are normally fed with their mother's milk and are intensively cared for after birth, unlike babies who must survive on their own. There are two basic types of mammal babies, those who are labeled altricial and those who are precocial. Altricial babies are born after a short gestation period and they complete their development after birth in a nest. In contrast, precocial babies have a much longer gestation period and are well developed by the time they're born. Altricial animals like mice, rabbits, cats and dogs give birth to litters of babies which in the wild are hidden or kept safe in a nest or den. Mothers with altricial babies leave them for long periods while they search for food. They make milk that's high in fat, so they can feed their babies just once or twice a day. Precocial animals like deer, horses, elephants and monkeys give birth to one or two well-developed babies that can cling to or follow their mother while she finds food. Mothers with precocial babies stay together with them at all times for safety and warmth. And mothers make milk that's low in fat and high in sugar for energy. These babies feed frequently 
whenever they need. Human newborns then are also precocial. They're born singly and are able to see and hear and call after birth like other precocial animals. Human milk is also low in fat and high in sugar and human babies need to feed frequently. But human babies are unique because they cannot walk or cling at birth. In fact, human babies' brains are only 25% the size they will be at adults, as adults, and their poor coordination makes them unusually helpless. After birth, human babies' brains continue to grow rapidly as they finish gestation outside the womb. During these first few months, babies don't have a day-night rhythm and typically don't sleep for long stretches, meaning frequent night waking and a preference for close contact is completely normal baby behavior. In fact, it's a biological need. And as they don't have the ability to follow or cling to us, keeping them close is our job, day and night. But this biological need also conflicts with cultural expectations about what's normal for infant sleep in Western societies, and also the ways in which parents are supported during new parenthood. Although humans produce unusually helpless precocial babies in many weird societies, weird being an acronym meaning Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, we try to leave our babies in makeshift nests for prolonged periods, especially overnight. This is only a recent phenomenon, becoming fashionable over the last hundred years. In the 1920s, two men promoted new ideas in the UK about scientific baby care that remain influential to this day. American psychologist John B. Watson on the left advocated infant care methods that he claimed promoted independence, self-control, and self-reliance in young children. While New Zealand physician Truby King on the right advocated fresh air, the importance of crying, and long periods of isolation in the pram at the bottom of the garden. Many of the cultural myths about baby sleep we still hear today originated during this era. The biology of early infancy, therefore, predicts that human babies will wake to feed periodically in the night, that this might persist throughout the first year of life due to energetic needs of rapid brain growth, and that they'll spend a large proportion of sleep time in REM sleep and less in quiet sleep than they will as they mature. Additionally, babies are born with no circadian clock and it takes several months for a day-night rhythm to become established. The biological view of infant sleep is very different from the cultural expectations of infant sleep in most Western societies, reflecting historical ideologies of the past century. What parents are told should happen with their baby's sleep is quite different from what they discover does happen. A similar thing, can be seen around the use of statistical norms or averages when advising parents about infant sleep. This graph from a systematic review of studies reporting total infant sleep duration in 24 hours shows the variability of individual baby sleep needs. Each dot and line represents a study reporting on the sleep duration for a particular age group. The dot is the average of the babies in the study while the lines indicate the range of data that make up that average. As you can see, in the first few months, there's no consistency in either the ranges or the averages. Study averages range from 12 to 16 hours, while individual babies who comprise those means range from eight to 22 hours total sleep time. Only at two, one to two years of age, does consistency between studies and between individual babies begin to appear. This variability then means that charts depicting statistical averages for infant sleep 
and statistically based recommendations for how much sleep babies should achieve at a given age don't reflect the behavior or needs of individual infants. Charts and tables for recommended sleep amounts for babies at different ages reflect the sleep of a mythical average baby in a particular place and time. Most babies aren't average, and you can tell a baby is getting enough sleep if they're alert and happy when they're awake. So many of the ideas that are prevalent about baby sleep originate in cultural ideas established 100 or so years ago, combined with data from studies conducted in the 50s and 60s, when the first infant sleep researchers began to try to define normal baby sleep. These studies established the idea that babies start sleeping through the night, which they defined as midnight to 5 a.m., at three months old. And this became translated in parenting folklore as babies should be sleeping through the night by three months, ignoring that half the babies who began to sleep in these studies for a five hour stretch at three months resumed waking again at four months. It's also important to remember that these studies were based on parents' reports of the sleep of babies who were in separate rooms at night and who weren't fed human milk. Popular beliefs about baby sleep today therefore reflect the practices and lifestyles affecting middle-class babies in weird societies 70 to 100 years ago. But it's very clear that fashions in baby care change over time in response to changing understanding of babies' needs and the changing nature of parents' lives. In research interviews I did 20 years ago, it was clear that, babe, that breastfeeding was negatively linked to infant sleep and mums who were struggling with their baby's need for frequent feeding during the night were likely to stop breastfeeding by a couple of months and reported their babies slept much better when given formula. So here are some examples from my interviews 20 years ago. Mothers said things like, baby was too demanding and feeding too often. Breastfeeding didn't allow a good night's sleep. Baby was too demanding, waking too frequently. Baby now sleeps solid 12 hours at night. Baby was unsettled on the breast and not sleeping. Baby now not fed at night. So you can see mothers were interpreting the need for frequent night feeding as being too demanding or baby being unsettled rather than being a normal part of baby biology. This was a topic that we returned to in a recent study to investigate how mothers today are experiencing their baby's sleep patterns and whether perceptions and practices of sleep and nighttime care are still influenced by how babies are fed. We used focus groups with mothers of different ages and backgrounds to explore public perceptions and mothers' experiences. What these women told us was extremely interesting and revealed that there were now two competing points of view. On the one hand, many mothers expressed firm beliefs that giving babies formula helps to reduce night waking, as they did 20 years ago, while others considered this an old fashioned notion. So you can see the uh, top quotes. With breastfeeding, you don't know how much they're having. If they're hungry, they could wake up like two hours later or something. Formula and sleep is the key. Breastfeeding and sleep isn't happening. But the newer view, I think it's quite an old fashioned notion that they need formula to sleep better. My mother-in-law and my auntie are of that older generation. They're like, he's not sleeping through. You need a bottle. You need to give him formula, formula and solids. I was told that at three months and she left. I was like, no, I don't think he does. So these perspectives about the differences between feeding and sleeping influenced these women's understanding of infant sleep. Those who believed night waking could be managed by feeding formula also advocated that babies should be in a routine that fit with the larger needs of the family. While in contrast, women who felt this idea was old fashioned believed parents had to go with the flow and adapt themselves to meet their baby's needs. Parents therefore adopted different strategies for what should happen at night. 
So the first strategy involved, I always had all of them in a routine. I believe a baby fits around your routine, you don't fit around theirs. Whereas the other extreme was babies sleep when they need it and forget it. You've got to work around them and that's all there is to it. As often as she wakes is when she wakes. So advocates of the approach that babies should be sleeping through the night from an early age and fitting around their parents' needs felt ignoring their babies at night was an appropriate strategy that produced desired results. For instance, this young mum said, I was getting no sleep whatsoever. So after six weeks, that's when the baby was six weeks old, I asked my mum what she'd done with us. And she says like, do the tough love thing, which means like leave the baby to cry it out. So I tried it and I just stuck with it. And after two weeks, she slept all night. On the other hand, those who felt they should adapt to their baby's rhythms found other strategies that allowed them to harmonize the baby's need for regular nighttime feeding with their own sleep needs. So for instance, one mum commented, if he's having a night where he wants to nurse a lot, I'll put him in bed with me and I'll just sleep. And he latches on when he wants to, and it doesn't really interrupt my sleep a great deal. So by these focus groups then we amassed evidence popular wisdom in the UK still links breastfeeding with inadequate nighttime sleep, which leads family and friends to tell new mothers to feed formula or solids to encourage the baby to sleep more. But increasingly, some mothers rejected this view and felt that the fragmentary nature of infant sleep was normal and not something to be fixed. Overall, these women's underlying perceptions of how infant sleep worked affected the approaches they used to manage their baby's nighttime care, which goes some way towards explaining why new parents feel confused about infant sleep and feel they receive conflicting information as there are different perceptions and strategies being simultaneously promoted within UK popular culture. And parents often don't know why they're hearing or reading different information. One of the reasons we set up the baby sleep information source was to try to explain this to parents who were looking for answers. So having found out what mothers had to say about the links between feeding and sleeping, we went on to compare parents' perceptions of their baby's sleep with some objective measures of baby sleep patterns. We recruited 50 mother baby pairs to take part in a study of the relationship between feeding and sleeping during the baby's first 18 weeks of life. We used these active watches, which are movement sensors the babies wore around their leg to measure when the babies were awake and asleep. And we asked mothers to complete a sleep log each night, which captured mothers' perceptions of when their babies were awake and asleep. We recruited mums on the hospital postnatal ward shortly after their babies were born and we only signed up those who had made a firm decision that they were going to either breastfeed or to formula feed their baby until at least 18 weeks. Mums logged sleep data and babies wore active watches every fortnight from when the babies were four to 18 weeks of age. So here we look at babies' total overnight sleep time from bedtime to get up time every two weeks. And we show the data by maternal report, which are the darker bars, and aptigraphy, which are the lighter bars, each showing breastfed and formula fed babies. The aptigraphy data, the gray bars, show that there was very little difference in the total sleep time of breast and formula fed babies. So if you look every two weeks at the gray bars, they're very close. There's not a lot of difference in the number of minutes that sleep that babies were getting until we get to the very last week when the breastfed babies got quite a lot more sleep than the formula fed babies. Maternal reports didn't differ much from the aptigraphic data in the beginning, you can see, but there's an indication that the mums feeding their babies with formula began to overestimate how much their babies slept from week eight until the end of the study. So if you compare the second dark bar with the second gray bar. That's the, the difference between what mums reported and how much babies actually slept. That's the biggest difference 
going through. Then, when we look at the duration of the baby's longest nighttime sleep bout, we see very big discrepancies. The actigraphy data, which remember are the gray bars, oops, change the slide, sorry. Um, which are the gray bars, um, show no substantial or significantly different differences between the breast and the formula fed babies. But the mother's reports, which you remember are the black bars, are increasingly exaggerated. And they're exaggerated more for the formula fed babies than for the breastfed ones. This indicates that how babies are fed doesn't actually make a difference in terms of how much they sleep, since the actigraphy was the same, or how long their longest sleep period is for. But it shows that parents' perceptions of their baby's sleep are really quite inaccurate. And they're more inaccurate when the babies are fed formula than when they're breastfed. Now, when other researchers have looked at the sleep patterns of mothers as opposed to babies, they've also found there were no objective differences based on feed type, but there were again differences in mothers' reports and subjective opinions of their own sleep. We're not very good then at assessing either how much sleep our babies get or we get ourselves, yet our perceptions of what happening, what's happening at night is what drives our behavior. So there's a common belief that because breastfed babies need to feed in the night, they and their mothers both get less sleep than mothers and babies who use formula. But studies show that both groups of babies get the same amount of sleep as do their mothers and wake equally frequently during the night. But the mothers of formula fed babies perceive themselves to be woken less frequently. Perhaps this is because formula feeds, formula night feeds can be shared, or perhaps it's because babies sleep slightly further away and the mothers aren't as disturbed or the mothers sleep more deeply. Breastfeeding mothers are more likely to wake when their baby wakes and to be aware of more sleep fragmentation, possibly because of breastfeeding hormones or possibly because the buildup of milk causes them to wake more easily. Our understanding of normal infant sleep development has changed substantially in recent decades, including discovering that although infant feed type is widely believed to affect how a baby sleeps, this now seems to be more to do with parents' perceptions of their own sleep rather than their baby's actual sleep. One of the other key issues that research has revealed around infant sleep is how anxious and unprepared new parents are regarding what to expect and what might be considered normal, particularly night waking and how long this might last. Lack of understanding that normal babies wake during the night makes parents question their ability to parent and question whether their baby has a sleep problem. In our culture, we reinforce these anxieties by repeatedly inquiring of new parents about their baby's sleep in a way that makes new parents think there's something wrong with their baby, or by polarizing parents' choices around nighttime care as being either or approaches. We can begin to change the story around baby sleep and help new parents have a more realistic expectation by changing the ways we unthinkingly talk about baby sleep. Instead of pathologizing questions, such as how is he sleeping? Has she started settling? Is he sleeping through yet? We could ask normalizing questions that emphasize night waking is normal, that it's difficult, that getting out of the house with the baby can be helpful for both sleep and mental health, and reinforcing that it's really important to ask for and get help from partners, family, and friends. But of course it takes time to change culture. So while we're all working on changing popular attitudes that good babies sleep through the night from three months of age, we need at the same time to recognize the effects of the mismatch between current parents' expectations and baby sleep reality, which can result in conflict between the parents' needs and the baby's needs. When parents struggle to cope with their baby's sleep, there can be multiple detrimental outcomes 
all round. For parents, there's a strong association between baby related sleep disruption and parental depression. And poor sleep significantly worsens depressive symptoms in the postpartum period. On top of this, multiple studies have found parental mood disorders magnify the conflict between parental and baby sleep needs. Sleep disrupted parents are more likely to think that their baby has a sleep problem that somehow needs to be treated. Women in our focus group spoke about this, as well as the ways in which baby related sleep disruption interfered with their mental health, their emotional stability and their relationships with others. For instance, one mum said, sleep's been the biggest problem for me, like huge. First, you get like delusional and things like that. And you just, and I ended up getting really, really poorly off, like she says. I never slept an hour, more than an hour, until she was about six months. I got myself really poorly. Now, whether or not the mum actually only slept for an hour at a time, or whether she sometimes got more sleep, we won't know, but her perception was that she only got an hour of sleep at a time. And that was what made her feel really bad. Another said, I used to be very stressed about out, stressed out because of that. I'd have him sleeping with me, maybe on his own, just feeding him something different in the night, anything. It was like the eldest used to wake up until he was about 18 months. So that was a long time. I took him to doctors, I talked to the health visitors, everything. So this mum really thought that there was something wrong with her baby because he was waking in the night. It wasn't um, presented to her as being something that some babies just do and isn't something that has to be fixed. And one of the, the reasons why the pressures land so much on mothers uh, sometimes is because fathers who are returning to work and uh, feel as though they have to have a good night's sleep aren't very supportive and taking a share of nighttime care. So one dad in one of our conversations said, encapsulated this by saying, all that nighttime shit is her job because I'm the one that has to go out and earn a crust. So he felt he needed to get a good night's sleep and the mom had to do all the nighttime caregiving. Another mom said, I think you'll do out really just to get them to sleep in the night. Because if they sleep, like have a good night's sleep through the night, you're going to have a good sleep. Rather than if you're up and down constantly all night, you're completely wore out the next day, you're going to be in a crappy mood and not want to do an out. And another one commented, I was asking my husband if we can do anything to, you know, make the baby sleep a better sleeper. Because your whole life depends on, you know, how they sleep, doesn't it? And only then can you do other work. The search for solutions to resolve parents' sleep disruption often frames baby's night waking as a sleep problem for which the baby needs treatment of some kind. This notion of babies having sleep problems can be traced back to some of the earliest research into baby's sleep patterns. Moore and Ucko again's study of normal infant sleep development reported that 50% of six month old English babies exhibited problematic night waking. Nowadays, surveys find that a quarter to a third of parents in English speaking countries report their babies have sleep problems. In America, parents tend to define sleep problems to involve night waking and short sleep duration. Studies in the UK indicate that parents also include difficulties settling babies as a sleep problem, i.e. those babies that don't go to sleep when the prevailing culture says that they should. In, our contra in contrast, studies in Japan have found that few parents, only about 7%, perceive their babies to have sleep problems. The biology of Japanese babies is no different to that of UK babies, but the parents' cultural perceptions and expectations of what's normal differ hugely. Where baby sleep problems are commonly reported, studies have shown that parents' subjective diagnoses of infant sleep problems don't align with objective assessments. Babies are not waking as frequently or for as long as parents think they are. And parents who are experiencing distress tend to over-report infant sleep problems and seek more treatment for their babies. 
Baby sleep problems are therefore often artifacts of parents' distress, rather than something that's actually abnormal about the baby's sleep. But this can mean that babies are very vulnerable to the cultural pressure that is felt by parents to make their babies sleep better. So for instance, babies might be given medication, anything from innocuous gripe water, to painkillers, to antihistamines, to other products to help them sleep. They can be medicalized, where parents, as we've seen in some of the examples, seek medical treatment for a sleep problem that's not a problem for the baby, but is defined by its effect on the parent. Babies get punished for not sleeping. They're treated as naughty if crying in the night, uh, if they're crying in the night and they're denied a response or sometimes having their needs met. And most, in at most extreme conditions, abuse. Parents physically injure and kill children, sometimes from frustration or anger by shaking, smothering and harsh handling and sleep deprivation, of course, compounds this. And of course, it's not just the babies that are vulnerable. Parents are also vulnerable to marketing claims, not just for treatments that'll help improve their baby's sleep, but also for the multitude of infant sleep products that promise parents their babies will sleep soundly and deeply. And while some of these products may be helpful or innocuous, others can be outright dangerous. On the other hand, not all parents experience the effects of infant night waking in the same way. I've emphasized so far the voices of those who've struggled to draw, to, who have struggled to draw attention to the consequences of our cultural obsession with the idea that the good baby sleeps through the night from an early age. However, some parents figure it out for themselves ways of accepting and dealing with night waking as normal baby behavior. For instance, this mum said, it's like from the beginning, when I had my firstborn, I thought he was a bit sleepless in the nighttime. And then I just sat down and started realizing, if I won't accept this, then I think this situation is gonna go worse for me. So accepting that at the beginning of the situation is how I managed to deal with my babies. Another mum said, mothers should be aware before having a baby that you know there are gonna be sleepless nights and it'll be different. Another said, I think your body becomes used to sleep deprivation. I think it really does. I think you learn to cope on broken sleep. You learn to cope on five hours sleep. And finally, a mum said, especially having an older one, you have to get up and get dressed and get breakfast, take her somewhere and do something fun, even if you're absolutely shattered, because you have to. So some mums found out, found ways to just get on with it. Um, even though it might not have been pleasant, they didn't perceive it as a problem for their babies, they perceived it as something that they had to work around. So some parents clearly find that they can adjust to, they can adjust what's going on in their heads. They can learn to deal with the sleep deprivation of having a baby. But of course, all adults also have different sleep needs and different levels of resilience. And parents have worked out a variety of different approaches for surviving this time. Few of these have been rigorously tested to know how well they work, but this list summarizes the strategies that different parents believe have worked. So the most common, the most frequently heard about strategy that we uh, encountered is wait it out, that eventually most babies consoli develop consolidated sleep patterns if you wait long enough. And they do it at different speeds. Another is to adjust expectations of what infant needs. So changing what's going on in their heads, um, adjusting expectations of what sleep will be like and for how long, and also helping parents to encourage realistic thinking about the help that they need and encouraging their friends and family to offer help. So this is a time when parents often need support and we could do a lot more as a society to help them. Providing parents education about normal infant sleep patterns is something health professionals can do. Helping parents to work with their baby's sleep biology, educating parents about sleep pressure and circadian rhythms and the biological uh, sleep regulators. Parents can think about how they might minimize sleep disruption. So making night waking as effortless as possible, sharing night feeds, practicing safe bed sharing, etc 
helping everybody to get back to sleep as quickly as possible. Another thing some parents do and figure out how to do by themselves is to harmonize their and their baby's sleep patterns. So aligning parents and babies sleep as much as possible to maximize the benefit of the baby's longest sleep period. This might involve pushing the baby's bedtime back from the culturally expected seven o'clock for most children in the UK to something closer to the parents' bedtime or maybe bringing the parents' bedtime forward a little bit so that when the baby has its longest sleep at the beginning of the night, parents are, are, are maximizing their sleep at that time rather than sitting downstairs watching TV. Parents can also um, try to eliminate some of the anxiety around um, infant sleep. So adopting strategies to keep negative thoughts under control can be helpful. This is something health professionals can also teach or suggest. Sleep training options do work for some parents, but we should emphasize they shouldn't use them uh, until after their babies are six to 12 months old because using them um, before that time can increase the baby's risk of sudden unexpected death. We can also realize that they can be very hard to implement without support and they're not permanent. Oftentimes they have to be repeated because the effects wear off. So many parents are keen to avoid sleep training options. And most of all, kind of a long-term project is really to address cultural pressure around infant sleep, eliminate, eliminate the one size all advice and normalize variability in the sleep patterns between babies. So each family basically works out what um, is effective for themselves in their own setting. Um, but we can offer suggestions, we can uh, signpost parents to things that other parents have found helpful, and we can tell them what is evidence-based based on the research literature. In summary then, what have we discussed today? Well, we've learned that babies are born with a set of needs and behaviours that are consequences of our mammalian biology. We found that in many Western societies, there are profound mismatches between babies' biological sleep patterns and parents' cultural expectations. And parents experience their babies' sleep differently in different places. When reality doesn't meet parents' expectations, for instance, the baby isn't performing according to the cultural script, this leads parents to become anxious, stressed, and depressed. And depressed and anxious parents perceive that they experience more sleep disruption than they actually do. They're more likely to perceive their baby as having a sleep problem and to believe their baby's sleep needs mending. An anthropological approach to understanding baby's sleep needs at birth indicates the baby is unlikely to be broken. What's not working properly is the support and information available to new parents practical support, emotional support, and psychological support. So we can help new parents to adjust their expectations around infant sleep patterns being disruptive, hard to cope with, requiring a range of strategies and changes in what they're thinking. There's no magic wand that'll fix things, and parents who are aware of this tend to fare better than those for whom this comes as a surprise. And in the long run, we can start to challenge and change the cultural pressures and myths around infant sleep that can lead parents to believe there's something wrong with themselves or with their normal human primate mammal baby. And that's it from me. Thank you very much for uh, joining this talk and listening. Um, we're gonna move over now to a live chat. So if you would like to join the discussion, please follow the link that we've put in the chat box or the same link is in the email that you received uh, that led you here today. So it'll be nice to talk with you all and find out um, what your thoughts were on the research around normal infant sleep. And we'll see you over there in just a few minutes. Thank you very much.